A very warm welcome to all the devotees for Sunday Satsang with Raman Kendra Delhi. This evening we have uh, Shri Anish Ji addressing us on the topic of what is happiness from the book Who Am I? Anish Ji has been with us a couple of times earlier, but just a quick brief background. Uh, Shri Anish has been an ex-corporate CEO and a successful entrepreneur. After over a decade of intense sadhana, in 2017, he was guided to move back into public life. Shri Anish is a prolific writer, international keynote speaker, founder of Yugantar, a high-level think tank, founder of Sadho, and an initiative named Bodhshara. His first book, Let the Mud Settle, was launched last year and is gaining a lot of appreciation. When not traveling, Sri Anish spends time at his Himalayan abode in Dharamshala. Anish ji, I would now request you to, uh, to please switch on your video and uh, address all the devotees. Namo Ramana. Namo Ramana. It's a great honor and blessing today to be sharing this satsang space with all Bhagwan's devotees. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, I'm joining right now from the mountain time town of Dharamshala in the Himalayas. That's where uh, we have our small abode, small ashram. Today I thought uh, I will talk about uh, happiness, which uh, taking reference from uh, one of Ramna's book, Who Am I? Uh, I think the most concise, the most potent, the most uh, uh, powerful, most transformative uh, in this small book, uh, Bhagwan's teachings. If you're able to decipher, if you're able to really go through this, spend time, contemplate, meditate over each sentence each word that Bhagwan said, it could really transform the way we look at life. Maybe it will help us to come back to our real inner self. So in the book, uh, I picked up a question and a devotee asked Bhagwan, what is happiness? I will first share what Bhagwan said on this. And then I will uh, share some of my own thoughts and we could go deeper into this. The format of the discussion we will keep. Um, I will speak for, a, for some time on this subject. And then I'll invite you if there are any questions that you want to ask on the subject. And I'll try and answer them, go deeper into them um, as per my own uh, limited understanding and capacity. So the questioner asked, what is happiness? Bhagwan says, happiness is the very nature of the self. Happiness and the self are not different. There is no happiness in any object of the world. We imagine through our ignorance that we derive happiness from objects. When the mind goes out, it experiences misery. Let me repeat. He's saying when the mind goes out, it experiences misery. In truth, when its desires are fulfilled, it returns to its own place and enjoys the happiness that is the self. Similarly, in the state of sleep, samadhi and fainting, and when the object desired is obtained or the object disliked is removed, the mind becomes inward turned and enjoys pure self-happiness. Thus, the mind moves without rest alternately going out of the self and returning to it. Under the tree, the shade under the tree, the shade is pleasant. Out in the open, the heat is scorching. 
A person who has been going about in the sun feels cool when he reaches the shade. Someone who keeps on going from the shade into the sun and then back into the shade is a fool. A wise man stays permanently in the shade. Similarly, he says, the mind of the one who knows the truth does not leave Brahman. The mind of the ignorant, on the contrary, revolves in the world, feeling miserable. And for a little time returns to Brahman to experience happiness. In fact, what is called the world is only thought. When the world disappears, that is, when there is no thought, the mind experiences happiness. And when the world appears, it goes through misery again. Many, many years ago, many, many years ago, when for the first time somebody gifted me this book, I don't know why, you know, usually when you get the book, anybody gives you a new book, many a times you kind of, you know, just scroll through the pages or you go on the index and read. But I scrolled through the pages of this little book. And somehow, when I opened the book, I stopped at this particular question. And since that time, the understanding, the answer, the clarity that Maharshi gave on this has stayed with me forever. So today I thought in this uh, very first satsang, we shall talk about this. We shall go into the details of this, try and explore this from different perspective. Maharshi is saying that mind has this habit of constantly moving from inward to the outward. And this movement, whenever the mind goes outward, there is a deep suffering mind experiences. Whenever the mind comes inward, there is an happiness inward mind experiences. Let's look at it deeply. There are two sides. We call them Raga and Dvesha. Raga is something I like. Dvesha is something I do not like. This is where the whole life of a human being revolves around. Around the Raga and Dvesha. But there is an interesting element in this. Somewhere Ramna also says that it all starts from a desire. Yeah. So it all starts from a desire. The desire awakens in me and I want something. Because when I want something and if I get it, I get momentary satisfaction. But with the fulfillment of the desire comes something called possession. I am desiring for a new phone. And now I acquired the new phone. My desire is fulfilled. I should be deeply happy with that. But on the contrary, when my desire is fulfilled, I get trapped into the possession of this phone. Now all my focus, all my mind, all my attention is on the phone. I want to just protect it. There is a possessiveness about it. And phone I am using just as an example. Then pride comes in. With that possession, the pride comes in. With the pride, then the fear of losing the object comes in. This could be true to an object, to a person and to a situation. Bottom line here is, whenever the desire gets fulfilled, it creates another loop of suffering for me. Because the mind has gone outward, the object of desire is obtained, but the loop of suffering is continuous. By way of possessing that object, by way of feeling pride for that possession, by way of having fear of not losing that object. Yeah. Now, on the contrary, if I don't get the desired object, if my desire is not fulfilled, what happens then? We all experience in our daily life so many desires. Whenever the desire does not get fulfilled, it gives rise to anger. It gives rise to obsessiveness. It gives rise to 
frustration, it gives rise to enviousness because maybe somebody else has that object and I'm envious now, I'm jealous now. So if you see if the desired object gets, if the desire gets fulfilled, it creates a loop of suffering. If desire does not get fulfilled, it again creates a loop of suffering. Yeah, because, okay, let's also look at first the dvesha element of it. Now, I don't like something. It's the opposite now, the dvesha I'm talking about. I don't like something, but I have to deal with it. In that, there's a constant bhav of why me? Rejection. Cursing the person, the object or the situation. Pouring all my attention into avoiding that object, that person or that situation. Again, I don't like something, but I have to deal with it. Creates another loop of suffering. Yeah. Now, I don't like something and it is gone. It should be a good situation. I don't like a person. The person has come to me. I don't, but there's a dvesha. I don't like this person. And the person is gone. Or that situation is gone. Still, there's a constant fear and anxiousness that it might come back. Yeah. There's a constant anxiousness that the situation, the person might come back. And I might have to deal with that again. Again, the loop of suffering gets created. So if you see, because of this outer movement of the mind, this outer movement gives rise to raga and dvesha because the mind is moving outward. And if the raga gets fulfilled, loop of suffering. Raga does not get fulfilled, loop of suffering. Dvesha gets fulfilled, loop of suffering. Dvesha does not get fulfilled, loop of suffering in all four situations. I hope we are we're together so far on this. These four situations have come because the mind has gone outward. Yeah. Now this constant movement of the mind, as Maharshi also saying, that's the root of our unhappiness. Because as I just said, whenever mind goes outward, Either it will give rise to raga, which is I want something, some attachments, or dvesh, I don't want something. Yeah, it will give rise to either of these situations. And both leads to their own loop of further suffering. Now, why does this happen? Why does this happen? Because, you know, the five senses that we have, if you observe the five senses, they're all outward driven. Eyes sees outside, ear hear the sounds of the outside. My jiva, my taste wants to experience the taste of, an, of something outside. So all the senses are constantly outward driven. With the senses, the mind is also then following the senses is outward driven. Remember what Maharshi says, the cause of all the suffering is this outward movement of the mind. He gave the beautiful analogy that in the scorching sun, if somebody is constantly outside, this is dukkha, this is suffering. Yeah. Because the mind and the sun senses are constantly focused on the vishaya outside, this movement happens. This moment happens. So what is the way out? Or even before that, why again it is happening? And there's a simple reason for that is, this is what we are feeding the mind. Whatever we feed the mind, mind concentrates on that. The important statement I'm making. Very important statement. Whatever we feed the mind, Mind's attention and focus constantly becomes on that. Any vishaya, any person, any situation, if I continuously feeding the mind with that, 
Hmm? Mind starts to become obsessive about it. Yeah, and the senses are now all outward driven. Yeah. So what is the way out? How do I, you know, in this satsang, my my objective is also to explore the solutions in the most practical ways. Can this be done? Is it really possible? So first, why is it happening? What's the cause of this movement? Can this movement be stopped? Is there a solution? Is there some way out of this? Yeah. I made a statement. It all depends on what is it that we are feeding. Yeah. So take a mental note of this word feeding and we'll come back to this. Yeah. Now be very careful what we feed because that is what is going to produce the results later. Hmm? Even when the inner inquiry, as Maharshi is saying, even when we are doing the inner inquiry, be very, very clear the objective. What again are we feeding the mind with that? And I'll come to the explanation of that in a bit. Have you ever experienced that? If you're very bloated, you've eaten something, you're very bloated, then it will be very difficult for you to sit and contemplate. Sit and do an inner inquiry. Have you ever experienced that? Yeah. Or whenever your system, your even physical system is not in tandem, not in harmony, it's very difficult to sit and contemplate or do this practice as Bhagwan says of inner inquiry. Somewhere I, I read, uh, it's why is it happening? Because you fed something not good to the body. And somewhere uh, I read Maharshi is also saying that feed your body with the sattvic food. It aids in contemplation. Yeah, I remember many years ago for the first time when I went to uh, Thiruvannamalai at the Ramana Ashram. My first visit was absolutely accidental. You know, I I did not know about him. I was not intended to go to Yamuna Ashram, but as uh, Shiva's plays and uh, Bhagwan's blessings are, I ended up being in the ashram. And the first thing uh, I experienced there was the food, the sattvic food, the sattvic food with the love it was served, with the pure bhav with which it was cooked, and with the pure bhav. We all sat in that uh, large hall and, you know, ate that food. Later, I also learned that Bhagwan himself used to get up at about 2.33 a.m., go to the kitchen and without, maybe there were not attendants or people, even then he would go to the kitchen and start to chop the vegetables for the morning meal that is to be, that is to be prepared. Bhagwan himself doing that service for the devotees, chopping vegetables, doing the basic inter initial preparations for the cooking. Because I think, and this is, I'm using the word, I think, he was very clear about the intake of sattvic food for a sadhak. He was very, very clear on that. So with that understanding, with that understanding, I'll give you four preliminaries today, four foundations today. If we follow these four foundational aspects, these four principles, it will aid in our contemplation. It will aid in our happiness. It will aid in turning the mind inward. Yeah. Okay. So number one, and picking up from where... I gave the example of the food being served in the, in the ashram. In a way, this is a question also to all of us. We're all on the path of sadhana in some way or the other, in some practice or the other. For a sadhak, and I'm assuming that we're all listening to this satsang today. We're all sadhak, yeah? in whichever capacity, in whichever degree, but we're all our sadhaks. We're seeking happiness. We're seeking ananda. We're seeking the self. We're seeking the truth. Yeah. These are different names for the same thing, by the way. For all of us, how conscious are we 
about what we feed our body with. What we feed our body with. Yeah. If you see, if any of you has has experienced uh, uh, living with athletes, let's say, people who, who play sports, there's a very specific food intake that an athlete takes because of the work or the control of the body that he or she needs. Similarly, if you look at a soldier, a soldier's food intake is of a very different nature. Very different nature because there has to be a certain fearlessness, aggression, yet balance in a, in a soldier. Yeah, Very different diet. If you look at householders, and we are all householders, I'm assuming, uh, householders have a very different kind of diet. Many times they... Uh, they would just take anything that is being cooked or that is being served to them. Uh, they don't exercise much choice. And I'm making a generic statement here. Now, if for everybody, soldier, athlete, householder, there are different diets, then what about a seeker? <clears throat> because to me, I think uh, a seeker's work of seeking, focus of seeking, desire of seeking, intention of seeking, it's a very supreme work, according to me. It's a very great inquiry. It's a very essential inquiry. Probably this is the most essential inquiry for life. Probably this is the whole reason of taking birth. To me, that's the most essential function, the inquiry. Going deep into that. If our focus, our work is so very important, so very clear. Then our diet also, what we feed the body also has to be in line. Like an athlete, like a soldier, like a householder, a seeker is also trying to attain something. And as I said, give, give you an example. And I'm sure this is an example of most of us in different situations. If in the body you're not feeling well, it will be very difficult for you to contemplate and do your sadhana or do even in another inquiry. It will be very difficult because the entire attention of the mind will be pulled by the organ which is not happy, which is giving pain, which is giving trouble. Yeah. So that's the first fundamental. First fundamental. It's, it's very strange that and again, I'm making a generic statement that this first principle I feel is missing in most of the seekers. I, in a month, uh, these days meet few hundred to few thousand people in different settings, different occasions. In most of them, I see this consciousness towards what they are feeding. See, body is the first unit. Yes, we are not the body. Very true, we are not the body. But it's, it's the first medium, first tool which will aid in the inquiry. If this tool is not perfect, and we're just talking about food intake right now, taking clue from the ashram food, taking the clue that why Maharshi was keen on in the morning doing this seva for the devotees of chopping the vegetables. My internal feeling is, we could debate on that. My internal feeling is, Bhagwan knew the importance of this aspect. That is the reason he wanted always to bless the food which was being cooked for the devotees. And this was his way of blessing the food because he knew that to go or, or to go beyond the consciousness that I am body the support and need of the body is needed. It's it's a step there. Yeah. So that's number one. That's my recommendation preliminary number one. Yeah. What do we feed this body with? Is it in line with the with the sattvic diet as Maharshi recommended? So that's number one. Number two. 
number two. <coughs> What are we feeding our mind externally? We're just not feeding the body. We're constantly feeding the mind. Constantly feeding the mind with a lot of content. There's, these days, there's, a, there's a, some kind of a content explosion I see all around. All kinds of content. What are we feeding the mind? What quality, what kind of content we are feeding the mind? Again, just to give you an example. Just to give you an example. Let's say if, if around you, if somebody is preparing for to become a, a doctor or a UPSC aspirant, you will observe that these people, so somebody who is a UPSC aspirant, is feeding his or her mind with a very different kind of content. Current affairs, and, and, and all that, what is relevant for, for him. Similarly, and somebody who's preparing for an engineering or a, or a medicine, they are feeding themselves with a very different kind of content, which aids in achieving their luxury huh? target, which aids in achieving their target. Are we, are we aware what is it that we're feeding our mind with? Constantly, am I, do I have the control? Do I exercise my right as a gatekeeper? This is the content feed for the mind I will allow. And this feed, this kind of food I will not allow for the mind because this food, if I allow, it will not help me in my inquiry, in my sadhana. I meet people and I often, sometimes if, you know, the discussion goes that way, I ask them what kind of dreams that you see if you see dreams. Even just by looking at the quality or the content of their dreams, you can imagine the content they are consuming every day. It is a direct reflection of the content being consumed. So again, a, a self-check mechanism. Observe your dreams. Just see what kind of dreams are coming to you. Because we all dream. The dreams will define or will actually show you as a, as a mirror that probably you are intaking a certain kind of content. You're giving a certain kind of feed to the mind, which is translating into certain kinds of dreams. Yeah, there is probably a direct correlation there. So which means what? We just can't go about reading anything that comes our way as a seeker, I'm saying. We just cannot go around watching any content, any video that comes our way. We just can't go around, uh, uh, you know, in the marketplace, seeing things that we're seeing all around. In my own practice, I've, I've observed that uh, many times, if you actually walk with your gaze down, which is you do not want a certain kind of content to be fed to your mind. In those situations, if you walk with your gaze down, let's say you're in a market area, you are in a space where you, you cannot avoid it. But you know that content, that feed is not good for your mind because of your sadhana, because of your spiritual practice. And if you walk with your gaze down, it really helps. Because you, you've exercised your intelligence, your right to choose what feed do you want to give to the mind and what do you want. What, what you want to avoid. Yeah. To me, that is a second fundamental, second preliminary. What is it that we're feeding the mind? And this is extremely critical because, as I said, these are the times of uh, content explosion everywhere, every platform, every media platform, all around us. It's the overload of the content. Probably in the earlier ages, it was not so. Maybe that was the reason it was easy to uh, control the movement of the mind. Uh, as, as Bhagwan said, the mind keeps going outward, the mind keeps coming inward. But what I'm observing these days, you know, in the answer when I was reading, Bhagwan says, 
mind keeps going outward keeps coming back inward when the mind comes back inward it experiences happiness when it is outward it experiences suffering yeah i'll tell you what i observe these days strangely i think the times the mind is coming back to its home inward are far and few in between most of the time because of this content explosion the mind is constantly outward constantly outward we not exercising the choice of what we feed this and because we we not exercising that choice whatever we feed it goes there whatever we feed it goes there constantly so the quality of mind has become very very what is the word should i use um non focused so to say any color any sound any video anything anything calls mind out and mind just runs away that because it it's like a child now who has served how developed the habit to be always out in the world always out in the circus this child is just not coming back home anymore maybe the child comes back home for a bit but most of the time because the 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 play is so colorful now i'm talking about the content the child is constantly consumed outward maybe that's the reason and i'm saying maybe that's the reason that the mental suffering has increased in the last couple of decades and this is my personal observation my parents generation i still saw them happy in between they used to laugh there were no words like depression or anxiety probably they were just they didn't know those these words yeah today even a school kid would come and say that i am feeling depressed yeah what has happened why is it so because i think the content explosion we've let the mind lose in the world the mind only now knows probably the outward movement yeah so that's the second most important fundamental preliminary yeah third what is my constant inner focus what is the internal feeding in the internal system yeah earlier i said in the second preliminary what is it that we feeding the mind from the outside now i'm saying what are we feeding the mind from the inside there is a difference yeah outside feeding is the content so my senses go out they get some content they feed the mind from outward to the inward in the third preliminary i'm suggesting what is the internal focus what is the internal chattering what is the internal focus most of the time yeah let me put it differently what are the subject of your thoughts most of the time yes i know the the idea is to go beyond it come to the self but we are talking about preliminaries today yeah so what is the content in your head most of the time what are what is the content of your thoughts most of the time what are the subjects of your internal chatter most of the time very important to observe this very important to to guide this in a way many a times you would sit to do an internal inquiry or to do your sadhana any practice and you will see internal focus just in a few moments goes to something else it is very important to observe during the day throughout the day what kind of thoughts you're feeding to your own selves let me repeat what kind of thoughts you're feeding to your own self yes we feed thoughts to our own self yes we can decide the content or the subject of our thoughts 
at a certain stage of sadhana it might not be possible for us and i'm saying some of us it might not be possible to shut the thought process in the initial stages of inquiry sadhana it might not be easy to shut the thought process completely to observe those silent gaps as bhagwan says what do we do in those cases because some content the mind is internally engaged with i call it internal chattering if you cannot stop that process at least we can try and give the mind through our own thoughts the right food to chatter about and i'm still using the word chatter because mind will still chatter not keep silent it is all right in the in this phase in this phase it is all right but it is important to change the subject matter of this chatter it does wonders if you try that so let's say throughout the day i'm outward i'm in my job i'm in my office i'm here and there wherever i am whatever i'm doing in my life every now and then every few minutes if i just come back to the self and give a thought bite to my own mind that let me think about bhagwan's teaching for a minute let me think about bhagwan's teaching let me think about what bhagwan says on happiness it will take you half a minute probably huh? to feed your internal mind with thoughts of bhagwan let's say with the image of bhagwan with the feeling that you ever felt a deeper connection with bhagwan and you feed that you remove the earlier content of the chatter internal chatter you replace it with this content with this thought you interject this thought to the mind slowly you will see this will become your focus this will become your internal focus you'll be doing your work and at the back the remembrance of bhagwan his teachings and at a very subtle level even internal inquiry will continue to go on while you're doing performing your karma in the world doing the necessary responsible actions in the world it will just continue to happen the internal background remembrance of bhagwan's work bhagwan's teachings bhagwan's image bhagwan's message and your internal inquiry this third preliminary is also extremely important संक्षेप में समराइजिंग दिस थर्ड प्लेनरी यूटिलाइज योर पावर एंड यू ऑल ऑल ऑफ अस हैव दिस पावर टू डिसाइड द कंटेंट ऑफ योर इंटरनल थॉट्स टू चेंज द कंटेंट ऑफ योर इंटरनल चैटर या टिल द टाइम द चैटर कंप्लीटली एंड्स दिस इज एन इंटर बिटवीन स्टेज या और 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 हाउ डू वी से a quick a quick step in between so to say yeah so that's the preliminary number 3 now the preliminary number 4 we are all as i said we are all sadhaks we want to attain this self we want to experience this self continuously but as a sadhak have we made this our ultimate purpose of life have we made this as our only purpose in life have we put this at the top of my life's objectives everything else is secondary i usually ask sadhaks to create a list of essentials and non essentials there are a lot of things that we do during the day which are non essentials then there are things we do during the day which are essentials once that list is bifurcated on top of that list you create or you put satya moksha ananda realization self as the highest purpose is this clear to us have we made this the sole purpose of our life like uh, uh, like like bhagwan did after his first encounter with death 
realization of the self became the sole purpose of his life. He had already realized the self in that moment, in that experience. He wanted to perfect it, perfect it, go deeper, as much deeper as there is a possibility. And that became the only purpose of his life. The, 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 the highest purpose of his life. Was he not feeding himself? Was he not taking care of, the, of, of his mother in the, in the cave there? Yes, he was taking care of all of that. He was performing the, the task that had to be performed. But this became the highest purpose or the only purpose. Any great master, Adi Shankaracharya, by the age 32, he did what people are not able to do in you know, many janmas together. Because this inquiry, this knowing the truth, realizing the Shiva within, realizing this Shiva Tattva within was the sole purpose of Shankara's life. Why I'm talking about this fourth preliminary today? Because, because of the number of Sadhaks I meet now, I observe in them this inquiry towards self and the truth is one of the things for them in life or is one of the background things for most of them in life. In the satsang, it comes in the front. It becomes the primary objective of their life. But after the satsang, when they go back to their homes, when they go back to their life, wherever they belong, whatever they do, this becomes a secondary process. This does not remain as the key, focus, original, highest, only purpose in their life. And I think that's where, that's where we miss it. If satya, if self does not become the sole purpose of your existence, then to be very difficult, then all the three preliminaries that I talked about, no, they actually come from the fourth preliminary. If the fourth preliminary, which is this is the sole purpose of my life. I am born for this. This sharira is given to me for this. This, this manas is given to me for this. My surroundings are given to me by, for this. Ashirwa, the blessings of the masters are given to me just because of this. If this becomes the highest, the sole, the only purpose of this life, then all the three will start to fall in line. Then you will not feed the body which takes it into the tamasa. Then you will only feed the body with the sattvic food because that, uh, that aids in the highest purpose, the final purpose. Then you will not allow the mind to be fed with any kind of content. You will be very careful. You will only feed the mind with that content which serves the highest purpose. You will not let mind to do internal chatter or any subject, any thought. You will give the subject and the thought to the mind for internal chatter before, of course, a time will come, a day will come when you will take it away from the mind and you'll say, today, now you're trained enough. No need for any chatter, negative, positive, both. Huh? All chatters will stop. And that is when we will start to experience this silence of the self. As I said, these three will happen when the fourth is clear. And through different ways, different teachings, this is what Maharishi is trying to tell us. Or this is what I heard from Maharishi when I sat at his meditation hall. This is what I heard from him. Maybe he speaks different things to different sadhakas. I do not know. But this is what he spoke to me about. And since that day, these four preliminaries have become foundational part of my sadhana. So that's the reason I thought today, with his blessing, with his grace, I should share these four preliminaries with all the sadhakas here. Yeah, with that, I will 
stop my my sharing for now if there are any questions you may want to ask uh, i'll be happy to try and answer them to the best of my ability anish many uh, thanks uh, for addressing us uh, i'm just going through our youtube screen uh, i yeah. think there is one comment stroke question by one name uh, himalayan avdoot he is asking why does your name have a prefix of shri so you might like to take that <laughs> well though it uh, is not related to the subject but it is very interesting that before uh, this satsang today when i sat on this chair i got this uh, intuition that today somebody is going to ask me about this <laughs> yeah so why uh, i'm not sure uh, my dear sadak friend why i have this uh, but one of my very dear vedantic teacher many many years ago when i was understanding the deeper workings of vedanta from him a point in our journey came when he said that the time has come for you to uh leave me go away i've shared you've learned it and now the time has come when i want to prefix shri uh in front of your name and uh, i took it as his blessing the parting blessing from him and since that day onwards uh, i started writing shri in front of my name um i don't know maybe it's it's his way of uh, uh, appreciating the student in me it was his way of uh, uh, imparting the degree to me it was his way of saying that uh, now you may go in the world and talk about this because before that i for almost 10 years when i started my sadhana period for about 10 years i was not allowed to speak on these subjects i was not allowed to share whatever was uh being experienced by this being uh so i largely uh kept quiet and only after uh this shri was given to me uh this was also an internal indication that now the time has come uh i'm asked to go out be in the public space and share whatever little i know about life of the great masters and their deep profound teachings maybe anishri thank you so much uh, we do not have any further questions uh, yes we have got one question on zoom from monica singh i shall read quote what is the process of stopping thoughts unquote yeah uh, as uh, bhagwan would often say that you go inward see the self and when you start to see that when you start to experience that the thought flow starts to stop on its own that's a deep profound teaching but monica ji if you if you took a note of the four preliminaries that i shared with you to me that's a very profound very practical very workable process of stopping the thoughts yeah but as i said you'll have to do all of these four preliminaries yeah and just to give you a quick quick insight into that before you even attempt to stop the thoughts in this yuga in these times and i'm referring the word this yuga in these times it is very important to give the your your chosen content bites to your mind to nibble upon so first process of that first process even before you enter into trying and stopping the thought is to give the right thoughts to the mind train the mind first to think about the things that you want the mind to think about let me repeat that again to train the mind to think about the thoughts that you want the mind to think about yeah it should not think anything that it wants yeah if you are able to do that then for you to enter into the silent spaces or 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 decluttering the thought process will become very easy yeah but first establish yourself 
in this power so that you're able to give the feed that you want the mind to think about. Yeah, if you're able to do that successfully, the second, the final process will be very easy. Yeah, try and do that according to me. Thanks. Uh, Anishji, we do not have any further questions uh, either on uh, YouTube or on the Zoom channel right now. Uh, on behalf of all the devotees, Anishji, I would like to thank you for your kind guidance this evening. And uh, we shall, of course, meet you again sometime next month or as per your availability. Great. Thank you, Anishji. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Om Namo Ramana. Namo Ramana.